Hi there, folks. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, my name's Tucker Bamford. Uh, I am, uh, uh, I have been for about the past five years, a uh, full-time guide for trout fly fishing. Um, took a little hiatus this last year, uh, just working in the shop. So uh, some of you may have run into me in the shop in there. Uh, but uh, starting out in April, I'll be back to guiding full-time. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll bump into some of you guys out there on the water. Uh, but uh, um, thanks for coming to uh, tonight's presentation, uh, Spring Hatches on the South Platte River. Um, guys, I've been fishing the South Platte since I was like 11 years old. Um, that definitely does not mean that I know everything about it, uh, but I, I've got a lot of experience on the South Platte, the various stretches. Um, all the way from, uh, you know, down close to Denver and Waterton Canyon, all the way up to the headwaters uh, around uh, Tomahawk State Wildlife Area, if, if uh, some of you guys know where that is, uh, kind of in between Fairplay and Hartzell up there. Um, but uh, I will preface uh, my presentation this evening uh, by telling you I am not an, uh, uh, an entomologist or a biologist. And so, uh, you know, feel free to, uh, you know, pop in questions uh, whenever you feel like it. Um, um, however, there may be a few very technical questions that I'm not sure how to answer, um, but I'll do my best on those guys. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again for coming. Um, uh, again, just jump in with questions uh, whenever uh, they come up, guys, and we'll uh, answer those as they come. Um, so um, you guys can see on my title slide there, um, again, we're talking about spring hatches. And uh, to me, that means kind of everything from like the, uh, the first good hatches uh, at the end of winter all the way through like say May or so. Um, so that's really the, the kind of time frame we're gonna be focusing on uh, tonight, um, talking about all these different bugs. Um, and uh, you can see right on that title slide there, um, that little guy on the tip of my finger is a blue wing olive. Um, one of the uh, best spring hatches, uh, probably one of the most notable ones, um, but we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, here shortly. Um, but that, uh, that little guy is uh, right at the Deckers stretch of the South Platte. Um, so um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and move in uh, to uh, what we're gonna talk about this evening, guys. A um, <clears throat> couple topics uh, for discussion this evening. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on equipment for those of you who are either not familiar with the South Platte or maybe a little bit new to fly fishing. Um, mostly tonight, I'm really going to try and uh, dial, dial you guys in on uh, some specific hatch information and uh, uh, understanding some of the, uh, the specifics of each bug that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I'm going to follow that up, of course, with some fly recommendations for, uh, you know, imitating or simulating each different type of insect. Um, and I'll give you some presentation tips as well uh, as far as uh, the most effective way to present those flies to the fish. Um, so uh, first we're going to start out with just talking about some equipment, guys. And uh, hopefully you can see this uh, uh, bug approved equipment and you can see this uh, stone fly. Uh, that has uh, settled on the uh, the handle on my rod there. Uh, apparently, he liked the uh, the equipment I was using that day. Um, but uh, we'll also talk a little bit more about stoneflies here shortly, guys. Um, and um, yeah, when it comes to uh, equipment for the South Platte, guys, this is nothing uh, you know very different from what you would use on a lot of other stretches of uh, of uh, river in Colorado. Um, <clears throat> I mean, rods can be kind of like golf clubs where you could choose a very specific rod for the task or for the river that you're fishing in. But for the most part, the South Platte, it's kind of one of those medium-sized streams in Colorado. And, uh, you know, your pretty standard eight and a half to nine foot long, uh, four to five weight rod is going to be perfect for almost everything that you're going to do on the South Platte. Um, again, I'm just going to touch on this stuff pretty briefly and really mostly focus on the bugs, guys. Um, as far as a reel goes, you know, the biggest thing to remember there is just have something that's got a dependable, smooth drag to it. Um, you know, we do oftentimes fish some light tippets. There's a lot of small bugs on the South Platte. And so uh, to be able to match that up and fish it with a light tippet, uh, it's important to have a, a, a drag that will release properly and let that fish run when it needs to. Um, because there are some big fish in the South Platte on a lot of the stretches. Uh, so, um, 
When it comes to lines, just keep it simple. Uh, a weight forward floating line to match up to the weight of your rod uh, should work great for you. Um, of course, there's all kinds of specialty lines. Uh, you know, some people with a little bit faster action rod might want to go ahead and put on a line that's a half a weight heavy or a full weight heavy. Um, there's all kinds of specialty lines these days, guys, uh, to make that rig perform better for you. Um, but just keep it simple with that weight forward floating line. Um, when it comes to leaders and tippets, and uh, really, I, I'm, I'm focusing on dry fly and nymphing, or nymph fishing uh, this evening with the, tonight's presentation. So I'm not really going to get into talking about streamers much. Um, that's a little more specialized, a little heavier setups for that. Uh, but my general uh, leaders and tidbits for dry fly fishing, um, typically I'm going to use for dry flies uh, a 9 foot uh, 4X to 5X nylon leader. Um, I prefer nylon because it floats a little bit better. And um, I do, however, add fluorocarbon tippet at the end, even for my dry flies. Um, if you get on some internet forums or you talk to different people about dry fly fishing, a lot of people do not like that fluorocarbon tippet, uh, you know, for that because fluorocarbon is a little more dense and it tends to sink faster. But the fact is, to me, what happens is that tippet sinks right next to the fly and becomes virtually invisible. And so I do like to use that nylon leader, but I pair it up with a fluorocarbon tippet. And uh, generally, I'm just going to drop down one size from my leader to my tip to make sure that I have the strongest knots. Um, so a 4X to 5X 9-foot nylon leader with some uh, 5X to 6X fluorocarbon tippet at the end is my typical setup. Um, important to remember, <clears throat> a lot of stretches of the plat are very slow, flat, clear water. And so I do like to use a nice long piece of tippet attached to that leader, um, generally about two feet or longer um, to begin with. Um, with nymphs, uh, I'm gonna go a little shorter with that rig. The fish don't, to, they're not as skittish or, uh, you know, um, touchy when it comes to uh, the spots that they're going to hold and eat nymphs typically. So uh, shorter leader is fine and a little bit heavier is good too. So um, for me, a seven and a half foot, three X to four X nylon leader um, works great. Um, and then relatively short four X to six X fluorocarbon tip it off of that. And uh, you know, when I say short, I mean, I could go as short as about eight inches or maybe as long as, you know, like 16 or 18 inches. Uh, depends on the conditions a little bit. Uh, but the closer those fish are holding to the bottom, the shorter you want that tippet uh, to make sure that those flies are staying real close to the bottom where those fish are. Um, if you're seeing fish suspending up through the water column a little higher off the bottom, that's when you can get away with a little longer tippet. And that's going to give your flies a little more natural drift, but they're going to stay a little further away from the bottom. So that's always kind of the balance that we're trying to uh, uh, ride when uh, we're talking about choosing the length of tippet to add to that nymph leader. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, um, I do strongly recommend bringing a net. As I already mentioned, there are some big fish on a lot of stretches of the South Platte, and to manage getting that fish uh, handled and unhooked and uh, possibly photographed, uh, you know, um, it's so much easier if you have a good landing net. Uh, strongly recommend with a rub or one with a rubberized net bag. Um, that's gonna be a lot easier on the fish and also easier to get your hooks out of. Uh, you know, they just won't get stuck in there as bad. Um, Keep in mind to uh, bring some warm layers with you. Just because it's 70 degrees down in Denver doesn't mean it's going to be 70 degrees when you get to the river. And in fact, if you even look up the forecast oftentimes for some of these different stretches on the South Platte, it's going to be like 15 degrees or so colder than what the forecast says when you arrive at the river. Um, and that's simply because of... Uh, uh, you know, the way that the weather forecast works, they don't uh, always take into account the inversions that happen in these river valleys. Um, so just remember to take more layers than you need. You can always leave them in the car if you need to, but uh, it doesn't hurt to throw an extra jacket in there. All right. Um, so let's see. It doesn't look like we have any questions on that stuff yet, guys. So let's uh, move on to talking about some bugs. Um <clears throat> There's really just a few categories of bugs that hatch uh, on the South Platte in the springtime, guys. Um, and <clears throat> I put these in order of when they appear in, on the river during the season. Um, so uh, your basic uh, bugs you're going to generally see out there. Um, we always start out with midges. Uh, midges hatch all winter long, and then you get a really good hatch in the uh, springtime 
just before the uh, blueing olive hatches start. Um, so blueing olives are, of course, next. Um, guys, those are like trout candy. Um, I don't know what it is about mayflies that trout love so much. I don't know if they taste good or it's a higher protein trade-off or they're just easier to grab. But fish seem to really like blueing olives for some reason. And that means so do I. Um, but uh, after blueing olives show up on the river, um, shortly after that, you're going to see caddis. Um, there's a few different subspecies of caddis uh, that hatch really like throughout the spring and summer and into the fall. Uh, but uh, um, there tends to be a really good caddis hatch uh, on the South Platte these days, um, which is actually a little strange because before the Hayman fire, like years ago, um, it really, the, the most stretches of the Platte didn't get a great caddis hatch. But nowadays, uh, gosh, you go down to Deckers at the right time of year and you can see some really good caddis action. So we'll talk a little more about that. Um, Stone flies uh, generally show up shortly after the caddis. Um, those are kind of like the big bullies of the river, the big mean looking bugs. Um, and when I am talking about uh, timing of all these hatches, um, folks, like if even if you keep a journal and there was a great caddis hatch last year on like April 28th, um, and that may or may not be happening on April 28th of this year because uh, those hatches do depend on water temperature. And so um, the timing of those hatches can vary by two to three weeks each year uh, just based on weather patterns. All right. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit more about midges. Um, so um, Midges, uh, you can see this photo, guys, uh, looks a lot like a mosquito, and it's actually in the same family. Um, and, of course, you'll notice, uh, folks, throughout the presentation, I've given photo credit to folks who have uh, granted permission for me to use their photos. Uh, and this one is by Gif Beaton, just a really cool photo of a midge. Um, looks a lot like a mosquito, but does not have the little blood-sucking mouth parts, uh, the proboscis, uh, that uh, allows it to bite you and suck your blood. Um so, um, folks, like, I'm really horrible at Latin pronunciation, uh, but um, midges are in the Chironimidae family. Uh, I hope I said that right. Uh, like I mentioned, that's related to a mosquito, and they really do look just the same, um, except for the absence of that little blood-sucking mouth part. Um, so... Um, in March or April, if you're seeing like a bunch of bugs that look like mosquitoes, I pretty much guarantee those are not mosquitoes. Those are midges. Uh, mosquitoes need a lot warmer water to hatch. So, um, but, uh, basic life cycle of a midge, um, is, uh, starts as an egg in the river, of course, uh, as, uh, all these aquatic insects do. Um, then it has two nymph stages. Uh, which it starts out as a larva, which is kind of buried down in the mud in the river and then or, you know, stuck to the rocks in some cases uh, and in the weeds and stuff there. Um, when the water temperature is right and uh, the time of the year is right, the larva will actually change into a pupa. Um, so that's also a nymph. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, that pupa is the one that is ready to swim up to the surface and pop out of its shuck and hatch into an adult. All right. Um, and um, important thing to understand about midges, uh, they really are active all year. Uh, as I mentioned, that's one of the, the first good hatches that we see in the spring is a good, solid, like thick midge hatch. Um, this varies a little bit based on different stretches of the river. So some of you might be familiar with like Deckers or Cheeseman Canyon or the Dream Stream. Um, most of us tend to focus on these tailwater fisheries and where it comes out of the bottom of a dam. And that means a little bit more consistent bug activity and more consistent water temperatures, which is really good habitat for the fish. Um, you know, you can pretty much take any of this and apply it to the headwaters of the South Platte as well, uh, like up around Tomahawk State Wildlife Area or up there around Hartzell or Fairplay. Um, but what you're going to find is the bugs are just going to be a little bit bigger up there, uh, just size up by a size or two. Um, but like I said, midges are active all year, um, and uh, that's something you could even see a good enough midge hatch in the wintertime uh, to get some good dry fly activity, uh, just depending on conditions that day. Um, so I always have a couple of good midge dries with me. Um, but one of the things about midges, um, they're a little tough to dial in sometimes because they, are, they have a huge size range. And so these guys range anywhere in rivers, generally from an 18 all the way down to like a 32. Um, 
Now, do I actually carry size 32 flies in my box? No, okay? I know people who do. That's about as small as hook as I've, I've ever seen made. Um, but uh, I definitely go down to some pretty small sizes uh, to make sure that I can match up to those midges as well as possible. Um, and uh, kind of a variety of different ones, um, just some different sizes and colors. Um, not only do they come in a wide uh, size range, but there's a, a really wide color range of midges too. Um, they could be anything from black to red to cream, uh, brown, olive, um, tan, uh, almost any earth tone that you could think of, they do hatch in. Um, but uh, some people think of that red as like just an attractor type color. But it is important to understand that there are natural midges, uh, at least the nymphs anyway, uh, that are actually naturally red. Um, so you would definitely want to have a couple of those in your box. Um, and um, the largest bugs, the largest midges that you generally see on the South Platte um, are actually about this time of year. And so um, I haven't heard a good report that the big black midges have, had to have started hatching like down at Deckers just yet. Um, but guys, this is the time of year when it happens, late February, early March. Um, sometimes into mid-March, depending on the, uh, the year and what the weather's been like. Um, but uh, most people, I shouldn't say most people, a lot of people would tell you when it comes to bugs on the South Platte, the smaller the better, the smaller the better. Um, sometimes that's true, uh, but the fact is this first midge hatch, if you're throwing little like 22s and 24s, um, you're missing the boat because truly uh, that first midge hatch that you see uh, every spring that is that thick like big midge, you're talking more like a size 18 or 20 um, and it's generally black. So um, something like a uh, Mercury Black Beauty or um, you know a, a Rojo midge or a Jujube in like a size 18, possibly a 20, um, is going to be a really Really useful fly for you over the next couple weeks if you're out there uh, at Deckers or Cheeseman Canyon or on the Dreamstream. Um, so let's see what have I missed here on midges. Um, I think that pretty well covers it. Um, <clears throat> what you will find too as you get later into the season so like the the first big midge hatch like that's gonna happen around the middle of the day. And then a couple weeks later, you may, still might see a few of those midges, but they're going to be early in the morning when that water's still a little bit cooler. And after the midges hatch, that's when, you know, that next hatch will come off. Or you might even see a different midge that hatches uh, after that first one. Um, so really important to be just watching uh, for bugs all day when you go out there. And it's not just, you know, like I'm going to look for bugs at the beginning of the day and then choose a fly. Um, I'm constantly watching every single bug that flies by me and looking in every little eddy and every little foam line that I walk by um, to make sure that I'm constantly getting new information as to what bugs are hatching. Um, because truly, the bugs that are hatching, that's the ones that the fish are going to eat the most. Um, there's a ton of different bugs in the river as far as nymphs go at any given time. Um, but uh, the fact is the fish tend to key on one or two very specific insects because that's the ones that have left the bottom of the river. They're swimming up to the top, which that means that they are free flowing in the water current. And that fish just has to slide a, an inch to his right and grab one or an inch to his left and grab one instead of trying to go and dig on the bottom for bugs. Okay. Um, so um, I do go off on tangents. Forgive me, guys. But uh, um, let's uh, let's talk about some uh, fly recommendations for some midges. Okay. Um, Oh, in fact, before we do that, let's take pick, or let's take a look at some photos of them. So uh, first, you have this midge larva. Um, <clears throat> you guys, I don't use a lot of midge larva patterns. Um, I do use them occasionally, but the plain fact of the matter is, again, those are the ones that are buried in the bottom of the river most of the time. And yes, they'll wash loose occasionally, but for the most part, um, if there are midge pupa around, uh, which is that next photo coming up here. Um, those guys, uh, that's the ones that's actually swimming up to the surface. And so that's the ones that are free floating in the current and the fish are much more likely to eat that midge pupa if it's around. Um, you can see the pupa has a little more, go, little bit more going on than that larva. Um, it has like the big wing pads and the big white gills off the uh, top of that fly and a little bit more of a tapered body. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I definitely carry a good number of midge pupa patterns in my box, you guys. Um, 
And then, of course, the adult. Um, we saw that photo at the beginning in the midsection. Uh, I won't belabor this one too much, but again, looks just like a mosquito, but there's a huge different size range of them. And, uh, you know, uh, in fact, this one almost looks like it has a proboscis on it, but it's actually just one of that, uh, one of its legs stretched out to the front. Um, so as far as a, a couple of fly recommendations for midges, guys, some of my favorites, um, this is kind of a long list. Um, but this is all stuff that I find really useful. Um, and kind of my main colors I don't want to be without are black, red, and olive. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, black, red, and uh, cream. And I will throw in some olive as well. Uh, but uh, uh, if you've got black, red, and something kind of white or cream, um, that's going to cover like 85 to 90% of what you need for midges. So I'd focus on those and throw in some browns and olives and stuff too. Uh, but um, mostly, uh, you know, I'm thinking about those blacks, the reds, and the cream colored ones. Um, but I'll just run through these real quick. Uh, Mercury Black Beauty, great general pattern, uh, size 18 to 24 I carry in my box, just the entire size range they make those in. Um, Mercury Midge, uh, real similar to a Black Beauty, but that's white. Uh, so again, I carry basically that entire uh, size range personally uh, in my box. Um, as you're starting out, of course, like if you're just putting together a fly assortment, I mean, this might seem like an awful lot of bugs to put together. So at least just make sure that those colors are represented and, you know, uh, choose a little bit of a size range because, uh, again, those those midges do have a huge size range. All right. Um, top secret midge, another really good one. Sizes 20 to 24. I'm mostly using the smaller ones on those guys. Um, Zebra midge, probably about the most popular midge pattern out there. Um, black, red, and olive are my colors on those guys, and, uh, and sizes 18 to 22. Um, <clears throat> Rainbow warrior, that's really just an attractor, but for some reason they seem to work really well in certain midge hatches at times. And so uh, the pearl is definitely my favorite color on that Rainbow warrior, but I do occasionally use the black or the red as well. Um, but something about that rainbow warrior, it's real flashy. And when midges hatch, they actually form a little gas bubble inside of their nymphal shuck, which is what helps them rise to the surface to hatch. And so, um, you know, something with a little flash to it or like that mercury bead, like on those mercury midges or black beauties, um, is real handy. Um, Massacre midge, another really good one. That's got a little, uh, foam on the top that helps it float off the bottom a little bit. Um, Pure mage larva is another good one in red or black. And, uh, you know, again, pretty small sizes on those guys. Um, a crystal midge is another one that I use frequently. Um, and uh, very similar to a Manhattan midge, uh, if any of you guys have uh, heard of that Manhattan midge. Um, but that's another good one. Um, and let's see. Uh, looks like we have a question coming in. So um, what have we got there, Yvonne? Uh, Chris is asking... <clears throat> Uh, for size 24 pupa, do you still try to get eight body segments, or is that not as critical as you go down in size? Honestly, I'm not, like, I'm a very technical angler, and I, like, dive further into details than most people, but I don't worry about eight body segments on my midges, guys. Like, on a size 24 Black Beauty, if I'm tying those myself, it's probably going to have, like, four body segments because I just want to make sure enough of that black thread shows through in between the wire so that the, uh, you know, the primary color of that thing is still black. Um, but, uh, I mean, if you want to have, like, the most, absolute most realistic looking midge, sure, you can put eight body segments on it. Um, I don't bother, so... Uh, it looks like we got another question coming in. Uh, I'm just going to note that, yes, that is true, Tucker. You, you are the most uh, analytical angler I know. Uh, and that being said, <laughs> uh, the colors. So do you have any rhyme or reason, any seasonal timing, uh, any conditions that you're uh, picking one color over the other? Um, man, um... I wish I could generalize it for you, um, but the plain fact of the matter is the one that I can really dial in for you is that big midge that I already talked about, which is that big like number 18 to 20 black midge that pretty much starts the hatch season on the South Platte. Um, red ones tend to maybe work a little bit better in the wintertime for me or, you know, early in the mornings, but... Um, yeah, unfortunately, it's really just uh, it's trial and error and it's observation. And so if I see a light colored midge flying around, um, I'm going to put on a light colored midge like a mercury midge. 
Um, if I see a dark colored midge fl flying around, chances are I'm just going to put on something dark like a Mercury Black Beauty or a Top Secret um, or, uh, you know, some other sort of dark pattern like that. So, um, but yeah, I wish I could make like a, a cheat sheet of midges for you. But midges is a huge group of bugs. And so you just got to do the best you can observing every day you're out there. So, um, cool. All right. Uh, appreciate the questions. Keep firing them away, guys. Okay. Um, and gals, you know, obviously. Um, so let's move on to, to a couple midge dry recommendations. I keep my dry flies for midges a little bit simpler, you guys. Um, you know, uh, the fact is like 80 to 90 percent of what the fish eat is below the surface of the water. And so I tend to focus my assortments more on that. Uh, but you definitely want to be able to take advantage of dry fly activity when it happens. Um, personally, on the South Platte, most stretches, I am only throwing dry flies when I already see fish rising. Um, you know, there's just... Uh, uh, there's so much food in the water in this river that you, if you're just blindly throwing dry flies out there, you're probably going to have kind of a tough time. Um, but a Griffiths gnat, great general uh, midge pattern. Technically, it imitates a cluster of midges all clumped together. Uh, but uh, remember when you're matching those up, guys, uh, size is the most important thing. And so even though that Griffiths gnat might not look exactly like uh, the midge that you're trying to imitate, um, if you get the size right, then you're like 90% of the way there. All right. Um, Morgan's midge, a little more technical midge pattern. Love this one. Um, it's got a little trailing shuck attached to it. And so it looks kind of like a midge that's trapped on the surface, uh, still attached to its shuck, so it can't fly away yet. And I think the fish kind of key into those sometimes um, because they realize that that bug is helpless. And all the other ones are like flying and skittering around. And that one's just sitting still waiting to be eaten. So, uh, but black and gray are my favorite colors on those. Pretty small ones, 20s to 24s. Um, just a standard midge adult dry fly is another good one. It's a really simple pattern, um, but uh, black and cream are my favorite colors in that one. Um, <clears throat> this is the one that I focus on really small midges with because most patterns are really hard to tie in. Um, so my favorite sizes on that one are like the 24s and 26s. That's the ones I use the most, but occasionally I'll pull out something bigger on that one too if I don't have uh, something more appropriate to match. Um, I also threw a parachute atoms in there. A parachute atoms is like the most versatile dry fly I think that, you know, uh, exists. Um, it's actually the second most popular dry fly in America uh, next to an L. Carcatus. Uh, but um, in a good midge hatch, again, size is paramount. And so if you're just seeing some tiny little midges out there and the only tiny little dry fly that you have is like a little size 24, 26 parachute atoms, throw it out there. Chances are it's going to catch some fish for you as long as the presentation's right. Um, Cool. Let's see. Um, wow, I'm moving really slow and I got a lot to cover. So I'm going to have to pick up the pace a little bit here, folks. Um, all right. So moving on to bluing Alice. And uh, again, keep firing uh, questions away, uh, you know, as they come up, folks. Um, really cool picture of a bluing olive here uh, from uh, troutnut.com. Uh, cool website if you're kind of a bug geek like me. Um, just some really neat photos, uh, some nice close ups of some bugs. Um, but bluing olives. Uh, as we move down to the uh, the text slide here, are uh, in the mayfly family uh, called Beta Day. Um, so those are related to pale morning duns, trichos, red quills, drakes, sulfurs, uh, and uh, more mayflies. Um, but uh, they are uh, a little bit different life cycle than a midge. Uh, so uh, a blowing olive has only one nymph stage and then two adult stages. So that guy starts as an egg in the river and then uh, hatches into that nymph. Um, the nymph lives in the river generally for about a year, um, depending on the subspecies. And then uh, when the timing's right that following year, it hatches into a dun. Um, the dun is that freshly hatched uh, bluing olive. And um, then uh, the dun will molt. Um, and after uh, you know that dun molts, um, the wings become clear, and that makes it obvious that that one is actually a spinner. Um, the spinners are the ones that are the sexually mature bug that are ready to mate. So they get into a mating swarm, and then the females come down and drop the eggs, and the cycle starts over. Um, I'll show you some photos of those here shortly uh, so you can get a better idea. Um, so... Um, 
kind of little cool uh, tidbit. Uh, blueing olive nymphs uh, and pretty much all mayfly nymphs molt several times before they hatch. So that means they shed that exoskeleton while they're still down in the water. They're not actually hatching into an adult. They're just shedding that exoskeleton so they can grow larger, kind of like a, sh a snake shedding its skin. Um, many nymphs do that. Um, freshly hatched duns look like little tiny sailboats floating down the water. So, um, you know, if you see uh, in like March or April or May, some little tiny sailboat looking guys floating down the water, um, chances are what you're seeing are blueing olives. Um, that upright wing on that freshly hatched uh, blueing olive dun um, is a lot the shape of a sail on a sailboat. And uh, they kind of move in the same way too. The wind will blow them around, they kind of face into the wind. Um, so, um, in the springtime, blueing olives hatch in late February to early June uh, on most stretches. Um, frankly, uh, depending on the stretch, if you're going higher up, like to, up to Tomahawk or something, folks, like that should be still frozen over right now. So, like, you're probably not going to see any blueing olives right now up there. Um, but on the right day, you might see some in Deckers or Cheeseman Canyon or up on the Dream Stream uh, or possibly 11 Mile Canyon. Um, they all, blueing, off also, or blueing olives also hatch in the fall. A little bit different subspecies, uh, but again, today we're focusing on the spring hatches. Um, one important thing to note about blueing olives uh, and most mayflies is that the best hatches do occur on cloudy, drizzly, or snowy days. And um, folks, like a lot of people want to stay home when the weather's crummy, but I will tell you, like a calm, light, drizzly day or a calm, snowy day um, is like could be the best blueing olive activity that you have ever seen in your life. Um, so, um, you know, I know you don't want to like drive through a foot and a half to snow to get to the river or something. Uh, but just because it's going to be a little cool and drizzly, um, doesn't mean you should stay home. In fact, in my opinion, like if I could choose my day off of the week based on the weather, um, in the springtime, I would choose those crummy, like snowy or drizzly days, uh, to go out and fish because that's when you're going to get the best dry fly activity typically on blueing olives. Um, what happens is when that bug hatches, it has to dry out its wings, uh, just like a butterfly, like drying out its wings and stretching them out before it can fly. Um, so, um, on a drizzly or cloudy or cool day, uh, they, what happens is it takes longer for those wings to dry out. So more bugs build up on the surface of the water and that sometimes will tip the scales to where there's more food on the surface than there is down below and that's going to get those fish keyed on to surface activity um and so uh like i said don't necessarily just automatically stay home on those uh those kind of colder uh drizzly days uh, it might seem like kind of a miserable day to be on the water but that could be the best you know dry fly action you get all year all right um so moving along, uh, we'll just uh, show you a couple of photos of some blueing olives, you guys. Um, there's uh, first a blueing olive nymph. Um, you can see, uh, now this one, one of the tails broken off. Some have two tails, some have three, um, depending on the subspecies. Um, this particular one is obviously getting ready to hatch because you can see the wing pads on its back are very dark. Um, those go almost black just before those blueing olives hatch. And so that one's pretty much ready to go. Um, Next, uh, we got the blueing olive dun and spinner. Um, the dun is on the left, the spinner's on the right, and that dun you can see has an opaque kind of grayish dun wing um, and uh, that nice olive body. Um, the spinner, again, this is after it has molted one more time and is then uh, sexually mature, but you can really see clearly in this photo from Troutnet those nice clear wings on that spinner. Um, they're actually transparent. And uh, that's the giveaway, whether you're seeing duns or spinners. Uh, but typically what's going to happen is you're going to see the duns, um, you know, more kind of middle of the day. And uh, typically the spinners in the evening, but sometimes the following morning, um, they'll come back to lay those eggs. Um, and yeah, uh, moving along, we'll uh, give you some fly recommendations for those blueing olives, you guys. Uh, so nymphs first here, of course. And um uh, RS2, I mean, that's got, that's like one of my very favorite nymphs, uh, of all time. Um, and, uh, my favorite one would be like a gray in a size 20 to 22, but I carry a good range of RS2s in my box because it's a nice slender kind of, uh, uh, mayfly profile. Uh, even though it's not specifically tied to, uh, you know, imitate a blueing olive, um, it's a great, uh, great pattern for that hatch. Um, and I do carry a wide range of them. 
Uh, important to note, you guys, that the first blooming olive hatch you see in the spring is generally going to be the largest bug. Uh, so, you know, if you're just starting to see blooming olives on the South Platte, generally you're looking at like a size 18 or so. Uh, it's a pretty big bug for a blooming olive. Um, and then as it gets later into the spring, you're going to see that hatch, uh, the size of that hatch drop down to a 20 or a 22 um, before it finally tapers off and the water gets too warm for them. Um, Pheasant tail nymph, another great one. Um, generally, I use a flashback or a beadhead flashback. Um, for me, I mostly use the larger sizes on those, but uh, 18s to 22s will be uh, you know good ones to have for for blooming olive hatches as well. Um, WD40, another one of my favorites. Olive uh, being my favorite color, brown being a close second. Um, Juju betis, another good one with just a little tiny bit of flash to it. Um, mostly smaller sizes on those, 20s and 22s are what I go for. Um, Barza merger, I would say, would have to be my second favorite blueing olive nymph. Um, you know, anything from an 18 to a 22, again, based on the size of flies that you're seeing. Um, don't just assume that, you know, whatever size it says, you know, uh, on somebody's website or whatever is going to be the one. You have to observe that when you get out there. Um, overbite bait is one of my personal patterns, and so obviously I like that one. Uh, but uh, kind of pheasant tailish, but like a brown and olive color. Um, Darth Betis, uh, another really good one. The Olive or the Redhead would be my favorites on those. Generally, I'm using the smaller sizes, 20 to 22, but occasionally I use an 18. Um, and, of course, the ever-popular Chocolate Foam Back Emerger, a.k.a. Chocolate Thunder. Um, so another good one with a little foam post, kind of like that Massacre Mage we talked about earlier. So it rises that thing up a little bit off the bottom and looks like a bug that's rising to the surface. Um, and it looks like we got another question. Chris is back, and he wants to know, do you change your drift technique when you're fishing uh, blueing olive nymphs under an indicator? Um, for me, like for the most part, I'm going for dead drifts on blueing olive nymphs. And so whether you're using an indicator or you're using like a European style uh, nymph rig, um, pretty much I'm going for that dead drift. Um, the fact is, though, I always try swinging a few times at the end of the drift because for some reason, you know, occasionally you'll get some fish that are keyed on that movement of that bug from the bottom up to the surface. And so I do find it really important to, you know, at least every now and then just let that fly swing out until it uh, gets almost straight downstream of you uh, to make sure that uh, if those fish are keyed on a little bit of movement, then you're, uh, you're, you're catching on to that. So... Hopefully that answers your question, Chris. Um, cool. Well, moving on, let's talk about a couple of blueing olive dry flies. Um, some of these tailwater stretches on the South Platte, the fish can get a little bit technical and a little bit picky and fickle. So I always like to have a few different blueing olive patterns to throw at them. Uh, oftentimes, if you throw one fly at a fish and it refuses the fly, it comes up for a look and then changes it mind, its mind. Um, simply changing the fly pattern um, or maybe going to one smaller size can get that fish to come back and eat. And so um, I always like to have a few different ones in my box. Uh, parachute blueing olive is a great one. Again, sizes 18 to 22. Uh, sparkle done blueing olive, that's one of the ones I use the most. Um, it's got a good realistic profile um, and uh, it's a nice durable pattern. Um, but uh, there's uh, olive or the betis color in those are great ones. The betis is more of like a brown olive, um, but 18 to 22s on those are great. Um, when the fish are being super picky, um, I sometimes refer to the no hackle blueing olive as my secret weapon. And, uh, folks, this is like a one fish fly. Okay. The wings on them are incredibly delicate. Um, they just, they fall apart easily. Um, but when the fish are being picky, uh, and they you can tell they're eating blueing olives. This is one you definitely want to have in your box. Um, olive is my favorite color on that one, but I carry some gray ones too. Uh, mainly in size 20 to 22. Um, Film Critic is another good one for when the fish get a little picky. That Film Critic, critic Blueing Olive uh, is kind of an emerger pattern. So it's actually kind of trapped in the surface film halfway out of its shuck. And uh, when the fish are being touchy, particularly when there's an awful lot of bugs around, um, then you'll find uh, sometimes that Film Critic will do real well for you because they're just looking for the low-hanging fruit. They just want the easiest bug to grab, which are going to be those ones that are still trapped in the film. Um Again, of course, I added parachute atoms on the blueing olive, uh, you know, uh, page here as well. 
Um, if you guys have read my bio, you might realize that that is my favorite fly. Like if I only had one fish or one fly to fish in Colorado all year round, it would be a parachute Adams because it just uh, does a great job of uh, simulating a ton of different bugs, even though it's not imitative of one specific insect. Um, but um, yeah, guys, I mean, all those are very useful patterns, but the sparkle done and the no hackle, that's my techie stuff. Like that's the ones I'm going to throw in the Fisher picky. All right. Um, all right. So moving right along, we'll, uh, move on to some caddis. Um, so, uh, you can see another, uh, cool pick, pick, uh, from, uh, troutnut.com here, guys. Um, this is, uh, a caddis and for those of you who are not familiar with those, they look like a little moth when they're flying. Um, but when they, uh, uh, sit uh, on something when they they rest on something um, their let or their uh, wings actually fold down around their body So they don't look quite the same when they're sitting still but flying around they just look like a small moth um, and uh, Some technical details here for you the uh, caddis make or caddis make up the insect order trichoptera um, so um, there's, of course, a huge variety of caddis out there, um, but when we're talking springtime caddis, there's really just a few you need to worry about. Um, and uh, much like a midge, caddis have a life cycle of two nymph forms and before they hatch into that adult. Uh, so it goes egg, larva, pupa, and then uh, adult. Um, and much like midges, uh, I actually use uh, more, a lot more caddis pupa than I do caddis larva. Um, because caddis larva, um, typically, they, most of them actually live in cases and they're like stuck to the bottom of the river. So the, the fish would literally have to like root through the rocks and chew on stuff to get caddis off of those rocks or the sticks. Um, so uh, much easier for them to grab a caddis pupa as it's just floating by or swimming up to the surface than it is for them to try and chase down caddis larva. Um, I do use some larva patterns though because some of those will get knocked loose and early in the spring when there's not a lot of caddis pupa around, sometimes a larva pattern works pretty good. Um, adult caddis, generally present uh, March through October um, and just various different subspecies of them. Um, the best hatch that we generally see is uh, going to be in like April to May, um, anywhere from about tax day to Mother's Day. And if you're familiar with the Arkansas River, you're probably, you know, familiar with the Mother's Day caddis hatch. Same bug essentially hatches it, uh, you know, Deckers and on the Dream Stream and some of the other stretches of the South Platte. Um, and so that to me is the best caddis hatch all year uh, on the South Platte. Um, so I'm definitely uh, watching for that one, you know, uh, in April um, and uh, anticipating it starting because that's one of the bigger bugs that hatches in the spring. And uh, the fish will eat those a little more aggressively than they will a little tiny bluing olive or a, a, an itty bitty midge. So, um, one thing to note about caddis, um, they can be very effective uh, fished on the swing, um, particularly those pupa. Again, the pupa is the one that is ready to hatch out. So that's the one that's going to be swimming to the surface to hatch. And um, they tend to be a little stronger swimmers than midges or bluing olives. Um, so that means that tightening up that line at the end of your dead drift and letting that thing swing up towards the surface can be a really effective technique. And not only that, but it's way more fun feeling the strike of a caddis, you know, uh, on the swing um, than it is to uh, just see your indicator go down. So um, I don't know anybody who doesn't like to like feel that strike. Uh, it's pretty cool. So um, yeah, uh, that's pretty much what I got for you for uh, caddis. So let's take a couple of, or take a look at a couple of photos. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of caddis, uh, most of them really do live in uh, some sort of case on the bottom. of river. Um, this cased caddis larva photo that I've got here uh, is one that I took out of the Decker stretch. And uh, these guys, every little stick that you see stuck to this branch, those are all caddis larva. And uh, if you look carefully, you might even be able to see their little black heads poking out of the little bit fatter end of that stick. Um, the other main one you see on a south plot, there are some uh, that are in a little stone case. And so it looks like a little clump of sand stuck to the downstream side of the rocks. And guys, sand doesn't just stick to rocks, okay? Um, that's a caddis inside each one of those little things. And usually when you find them, you're going to find like a hundred of the darn things stuck on one rock. Um, but uh, the pupa, uh, again, are, are uh, 
again, what the fish are probably more likely to key on, but uh, in between there, you, I do have a photo of a caddis larva for you that's out of the case, so you can get a better idea of what those guys look like. Um, but uh, again, just not a pattern that I focus on a lot. Uh, I'm going to use the pupa a lot more often. Um, and uh, another photo from uh, trout nut of that caddis pupa. Uh, you can see that pupa has a lot more going on. It's got wing pads up on the front. Uh, it's leggy. It's got some long antenna, a little fatter kind of tapered body to it. Um, and uh, so when you're uh, talking about caddis pupa patterns uh, to use, you want something with a little more going on than just that slender solid body. Okay. Um, then we got a caddis adult. Um, this is uh, some sort of a speckled caddis. There's so many different uh, varieties of these things, guys. Um, but uh, they're all going to have basically that same shape, um, but the color varies quite a bit. Um, so let's see. Um, moving on to some fly recommendations for caddis nymphs, uh, folks. Um, again, I focus more on the pupa than I do the larva. Um, and actually it looks like we got a question coming in. So let's go ahead and take that question before I talk about these. Uh, David Scott's asking, are those caddis cases ever empty? Uh, yes, sometimes they are, David. Um, and so the thing is, it doesn't take very long after those caddis pupate and move out of that, that thing and go ahead and hatch. Um, until those cases just get washed off down river. So you do find some empty ones every now and then, uh, but the vast majority of the ones that you're gonna find on the bottom of the river are gonna have a caddis in them. Um, cool, so uh, yeah, some caddis nymph recommendations for you folks. Um, graphic caddis, uh, definitely one of my favorite ones for the South Platte. And uh, I tend towards the smaller sizes, like 16s and 18s. Um, olive is my favorite color, but I do occasionally use those tan ones as well. Um, but that thing's got just a little, just the right amount of kind of shine to it and just has that right profile. Um, really good pattern. Um, Guide's Choice Hair's Ear. So this one, folks, it's not really technically a caddis nymph, but it's got a great uh, kind of caddis profile and uh, that kind of tan gray color uh, matches up well to some of the caddis you're going to see. Um, and it's got that soft hackle on it and a tungsten head, which makes it swing really nicely. So that's one that I oftentimes use uh, as like a first fly on my nymph rig and make sure to swing that thing out at the end of your drift occasionally uh, to see if you can get some aggressive strikes that way. Um, Holy Grail, another one of my favorite uh, caddis uh, pupa uh, patterns. Um, I use both the olive and uh, I put tan in here. Technically it's hair's ear uh, on that one. Um, but some good bit of flash and, uh, and uh, that same soft tackle on it. So again, fishes really nicely on the swing. Um, and finally, I put in a buckskin caddis. There's a couple other larva patterns I use occasionally, but that buckskin, that's going to be pretty much my go-to um, as far as a caddis larva pattern goes. Um, there's also case caddis patterns out there where you could, which you can use relatively early in the spring. Um, but uh, um, again, for me, I mostly focus on those uh, pupa when I actually start seeing adult caddis around. Um, so... Uh, as far as caddis dry flies go, uh, a couple good ones for you. Elk queen caddis, as I mentioned earlier, most popular dry fly in America. And there's a reason. They float well, they're easy to see, um, and uh, they catch fish uh, for sure. Um, so brown, gray, and tan are your primary colors that I prefer on those. Um, but there's other kind of natural earth tone stuff. Gray, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, black rather, olive uh, you could use also. Um, but uh, the brown and the gray are kind of my favorites. Mostly I lean towards the smaller sizes on these two. So size 14 and 16 really uh, are pretty key on some uh, elk queen caddis. Um, a peacock caddis is a good one if you're seeing some darker bugs around. It's got a peacock uh, body and so it's a really dark caddis. But otherwise pretty similar uh, in look and profile of that care caddis. Um, Spotlight caddis merger, another good one. Um, that's kind of an emerger pattern that the butt hangs down into the water. Uh, and so um, it looks like, uh, uh, again, kind of like that uh, um, Morgan's midge we were talking about earlier. It looks like it can't fly away yet. It's still kind of stuck there. And uh, sometimes those fish really key on that. Um, olive is my favorite color on that one, but I do use the tan occasionally. Um, and again, mostly the smaller sizes. Like if I really had to pick just one size to fish for caddis, it'd probably be a 16. But I absolutely carry all these different sizes because, you know, the size of the hatch does vary a little bit uh, um, every day out there. Um, and finally, I put on here a stimulator. 
Uh, technically a stone fly pattern, but it works pretty good in smaller sizes for caddis as well. Um, olive and royal would be my favorite colors on those fellas. And uh, again, just smaller sizes on your stimulators if you're seeing caddis round uh, to match the size of that hatch that you're seeing. So about a 14 or 16 there. Um, and I think that uh, moves us on to stone flies. Um, another cool picture from uh, Trout Nut. Um, it's actually a really cool website if you just, like like I said, you geek out on bugs like I do. Um, and uh, that is an adult stonefly. Um, and uh, I wish I could tell you exactly what species, but it's obviously like a bright uh, yellow color there. Um, most of your stoneflies are going to be like either yellow or brown or black. Um, and uh, moving on to some technical info for you. Um, oh, actually, looks like we've got another question coming in. So why don't we go ahead and take that before we talk about this? Uh, Jason's asking, what hackle do you use on the Alpine caddis? What hackle? Um, so it depends on the, the, the one. Um, generally, uh, like the easiest thing, if you've seen Whiting 100 packs, those things are all sized so that all the feathers in there are basically the same size. So you don't have to worry about sizing them out. And it's just a good long dry fly hackle that's really easy to work with. You can get multiple flies out of one hackle. Um, but uh, the fact is the color is going to vary, of course, based on which color bug I'm tying. So, you know, browns and grays, again, are my favorite ones. So on a brown out care cat, it's, that's going to be brown, you know, dubbing underneath. And then like a ginger or a fiery brown hackle on top of that. Um, I do like to use a little smaller size than you would for a typical dry fly um, because uh, mainly um, I'm just going for extra buoyancy out of that hackle instead of like a really like obtrusive uh, leg. So, um, but then uh, yeah, brown on the brown ones and uh, then, uh, you know, like a dun or a dark gray uh, color on my, uh, on my gray caddis. So, but those whiting 100 packs, if you haven't used those, they're awesome. Uh, looks like we got another question. Sweet. Uh, John's asking, <clears throat> so the, his elk wing is a go-to sort of uh, hopper or indicator fly uh, for, for him. Do you recommend any others when small, throwing small flies behind? So when throwing a double dry fly. Um, yes, you can use a lot of different stuff for that. It depends a little bit on what I'm seeing. But I'll be frank with you, John. Um, my favorite lead fly to use on those little uh, double fly rigs when I'm throwing something small dry behind it is definitely an elk caddis. They're just so easy to see. They're so buoyant. And it's not like something big that's going to splat and scare the fish. Um, it's really important when you're doing that kind of technique. You know, you don't want to throw like a size 8 grasshopper on and then put a size 22 blowing olive behind it. At least I don't like that way. Because what happens is those fish are up there rising on top. That big old hopper splats right on their head and scares them down. Um, so I want something no bigger than like a 14, oftentimes a 16 or so, just big enough I can see it easily. Um, but some other patterns I sometimes use for that would just be like a larger parachute atoms, like a size, you know, 16 or, or so parachute atoms would be a good one. Uh, stimulator's another good one that floats really high and is good and easy to see. Um, you could absolutely put on like a, a, a stubby chubby or uh, some other like uh, small foam pattern. But again, just don't go bigger than about a 14 or a 16 with those guys and make sure it's something that you're gonna be able to see easily. And that's really uh, my main criteria there. All right. Um, cool, so uh, keep firing away the questions guys. Appreciate that uh, you all are uh, engaged out there this evening. Um, so stone flies. Um, Stoneflies make up the insect order Plecoptera, and uh, these guys are kind of the big bullies of the river. Um, they're big and mean and, and look gnarly, and uh, the fact is, though, like they can't bite you or anything, but they uh, definitely look like little weightlifters or something. Um, these uh, fellows have a pretty uh, uh, simple life cycle. They just go from an egg into one nymph stage and then hatch into an adult. Um, so... Um, that's basically the simplest life cycle in any of these bugs. Um, one interesting tidbit about stoneflies is they do live three years as a nymph. Um, so many of these insects are going to live for like one year in the water before they hatch. Some will live longer than that, but stoneflies pretty typically are going to live three years as a nymph before they hatch into that adult insect. Um, what that means is you actually have 
three year classes, so three sizes of any given species of stonefly in the river at any time. Um, which means you can be pretty flexible in your, you know, size choice. Um, and, uh, you know, stonefly, frankly, sometimes just makes a good attractor pattern. Even if you're not seeing a good stonefly hatch, um, you know, oftentimes uh, just putting on a stonefly, it's a big enough meal that the fish will move for it and uh, you get the right one and, and you can have a pretty good day even if there's not a good hatch going on. Um, so stoneflies also, like uh, those blueing olives and many mayflies, stoneflies molt numerous times as nymphs before they hatch into an adult. Um, what that means is uh, sometimes you're actually going to see stonefly shucks floating down the river or in the eddies or that type of thing. Um, and that may not necessarily be a sign that there's a hatch going, um, but what it does mean is those stoneflies are out and active. Because to shed that nymphal shuck, that stonefly has to crawl up on the outside of a rock where there's a little more current and then crawl out of that nymphal shuck and let go of it. Um, so when you're seeing those stonefly shucks floating around, could be a good sign that you might want to try a stonefly nymph. Um, beyond that, I would tell you it's actually a good idea to try a light colored stonefly nymph. Because when stoneflies do molt, then they become uh, as light as that thing is ever going to be in color. So like a golden stonefly freshly molted is actually going to be like a really kind of bright yellow. And uh, just before they molt, they're going to look more kind of like brownish and yellow. Um, so if you're seeing a lot of stonefly molts around, um, it's a good idea to try like a lighter or brighter colored stonefly, like a light tan or a yellow. All right. Um, one other cool tidbit about stoneflies, they crawl up on the land to hatch. So this is one of the few bugs that does not actually swim to the surface and hatch there and then wait for its wings to dry. Um, they actually crawl up onto the bank somewhere or up on a rock in the middle of the river, but out of the water and then go ahead and go ahead uh, and uh, split their carapace and hatch. A um, couple things that means to us as anglers. First of all, what that means is that uh, stonefly nymphs are typically a little more productive than stonefly dries uh, because they the fish don't have that opportunity to eat that bug as it's drying off its wings and just sitting on the surface of the water. Uh, really, the only time a stonefly adult is going to be sitting on top of the water is when it's laying eggs. Um, so that's a relatively short period of time. And the fish will take advantage of it because it's a big meal. But uh, I would tell you, you know, really focus on the nymphs with stoneflies. Eh, have a couple dry flies too, just in case. Uh, but really focus on those nymphs, all right? Um, stonefly nymphs, just like caddis, um, because those stonefly nymphs are actually crawling to the bank to hatch, that fly swinging at the end of your drift looks very, very natural to the fish because that is, it's just like that fly or that adult, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, stonefly nymph skittering along the bottom, crawling out to the edge of the river, getting ready to hatch. So if you are seeing adult stoneflies around, definitely, definitely, definitely swing some stonefly nymphs. All right. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, most popular uh, um, colors on those are going to be like in that brown or black or yellow or kind of golden color range. All right. Um, cool. Let's uh, move on to, oh yeah, some of the most common species uh, on the South Platte specifically. Um, this time of year, folks, you actually get what they call a winter stonefly or a small black stone. Um, those are about a size 16 to 18. Um, not a great thick hatch of those, but uh, even just seeing a couple of those could key into the idea that it'd be a good idea to put one of those on, like at least as a lead fly on your, uh, on your rig. Um, and that's one that a lot of people miss. They're too busy throwing eggs or leeches or scuds or something this time of year. Um, but that small black stone can be a good one. Um, next one you generally see uh, is a large brown stone fly. It's going to be about a size 8 to 10. Those are mostly going to hatch uh, in like the April-May time frame um, where those uh, small black stone flies I talked about, that's like early, early season, like February and March. Um, after those large Large brown stone flies come a large golden stone. Um, that's also going to be about a size 8 to 10. Frankly, the nymphs are kind of tough to tell apart sometimes, um, but that's going to be typically hatching a little after those large brown stones, uh, kind of more in that May-June time frame. And I threw in yellow sallies down here just because it's the other stone fly that's a big, pretty good hatch. But frankly, you guys, that's more of a summer hatch than a spring hatch, so I'm not going to belabor that one too much. But that's just a real small yellow stone fly, anywhere from a size 14 to 18. And they're kind of more of a bright yellow than they are, like a golden color like a lot of the other ones. Um, 
So uh, let's take a look at some uh, stonefly picks. Um, so this is a stonefly that I pulled out of the South Platte to down around the Decker stretch. Um, like I said, big chunky bug. They look kind of mean. Uh, you can actually like feel them clinging to you with their little uh, you know feet uh, when you grab them. Um, but cool looking bug. They can't bite you, so pick them up, play with them, um, and then uh, put them back in their home so that they can be uh, trout food and, and make those trout nice and healthy. Um, next photo is stonefly shucks. So folks, this is how you know that there's been a recent stonefly hatch, is actually looking along the banks uh, where stoneflies might have crawled up. And uh, this is kind of a group of stonefly shucks that were uh, under a bridge on a cement piling. Um, and there were quite a few of them. You actually can see in the background, you know, there's probably 40 or so of these things uh, just along this piece of concrete right here. Um, then you got the stonefly adult. And uh, um, again, cool bugs, they can't hurt you. Um, but uh, um, you definitely feel it when one of these things lands on you or is crawling around on you or something. Um, and it'll freak you out a little bit. But, uh, you know, like I said, no, no uh, harm possible from these guys other than, like, you know, uh, freaking out and, like, slipping and falling in the river. Uh, but hopefully that doesn't happen to you guys. Um, so let's see. Um, let's take a look at some uh, stonefly nymph recommendations. Again, I'm going to focus a lot more on the nymphs than the dries, folks. Um, so epoxy backstone, Mercer's epoxy backstone, one of my very favorite stonefly patterns. Um, and uh, mostly I use the smaller sizes on those, uh, but uh, occasionally I use some of the great big guys too. Um, but black or uh, golden slash yellow in little size 14 to 18 are real handy ones for me for the South Platte. Um, a wired stonefly is another really good one. Um, you're going to find with a lot of stonefly patterns, they have a lot of weight to them because stoneflies tend to live in fast oxygenated water. And so that wired stonefly is a good example. It's kind of similar to a copper john where the whole body's wire and then it's got a big bead on the front. Um, but uh, the golden is definitely my favorite color on those ones. And uh, sizes 10 to 14, I generally lean a little bit more towards the smaller sizes on those. Um, Pat's rubber legs, most popular stonefly pattern out there, folks. Um, I don't use them as much as some of the other patterns, uh, but uh, when the water's high, um, that's when those Pat's rubber legs really seem to shine to me on the South Platte. And uh, tan and brown, definitely my favorite color on those fellas. Um, coffee and black is another good one if you're seeing some darker colored stones. Um, I do use some kind of funky colored ones every now and then. Orange and olive is another good one that I like, uh, but mostly sizes 10 to 14 on those. And, uh, you know, if the water's real high, you can use a larger size on that path rubber legs because the bigger the fly gets, the heavier that thing gets. Um, tungstone, another good one. Um, little flashback on it and a good realistic looking pattern. Um, kind of heavy, so that's one that I'm typically just going to use when the water's up a little bit, a little higher, or I'm fishing like a deep, fast run. But uh, size 10 to 12 would be my favorites on those. Um, I do also occasionally use a 20-incher, kind of a classic stonefly pattern, um, but uh, about a size 10 to 12 on those are pretty good too. Um, typically for me with stoneflies, um, I mean, I'm looking at the size of the hatch, but more I'm looking at water conditions. And the lower the water is, typically the smaller the stonefly I'm going to use, um, simply because those fish get a better look at it and they get a chance to be pickier. So, um, but those are all great uh, stonefly nymphs to try out, guys. Um, fire some dry fly uh, recommendations for stoneflies. Um, stimulator, got to be my favorite. Um, yellow, royal, or black uh, would be my favorite stimulators. Anything from an 8 to a 16, again, just trying to match what you see out there. Uh, you know, if we're talking those little tiny black stoneflies in the spring, that's going to be like closer to that 16 size range. If you're seeing those big brown stoneflies, uh, you know, like a number 8 or 10 royal uh, is great. Um, and uh, I do use some of those yellow ones in like the, the full size range. Yellow stimulators, like that's my favorite stimulator. So um, morning wood stones, another good one in that golden color, uh, size eight to 10 uh, would be my favorites. Uh, Chubby Chernobyl, not technically a stonefly pattern, but great attractor and in the right size and color, it can match up to those stonefly hatches really well. Um, brown or gold would be my favorite colors on those, but there's a huge different range of those chubbies to choose from. Some people like the funky ones, like the pinks and the purples and stuff. I tend to be very literal in how I approach stuff, so I'm trying to match right up to that hatch. Uh, mostly size 8 to 12 on those guys uh, in uh, whatever colors I'm seeing. Um, 
Headlight Yellow Sally, another good one for that Sally Hatch. Again, I won't talk about that too much because that's more of a summertime thing. Um, but smaller sizes on that fella, 14 to 18. And um, let's see. A few more just kind of general tips to wrap things up here for you folks as far as matching these hatches. Um, keep in mind when you are matching hatches that uh, – fish basically there there's all this flotsam floating down the river there's weeds and sticks and leaves and junk floating down and uh so the easiest way for them to start to sort through what's food and what's not is by size so size is the most critical factor when you're trying to match up to a bug um so even if you don't have a perfect match for that blueing olive hatch that's coming off um you know you're much better off using like a parachute atoms that's the right size then you are using a blueing olive pattern that's two sizes too big, all right? Um, really, really important key uh, there as far as, uh, you know, getting those fish to actually eat your bug when you throw it out there. Um, but yeah, size first, then shape matters, um, you know, just the profile of the bug, and then color. You match all three of those, you're golden, okay? Um, something else, uh, I already mentioned this a little bit, I'm always looking for adult insects that I see in eddies and foam lines and along the river or even flying around. Um, but uh, it's really typically important to match your nymphs to those adult insects that you see. Um, you know, again, there's tons of nymphs in the water at any given time, but the bugs that those fish are gonna key on are the ones that are on their way to the surface to hatch or free flowing in that river current. So if you're just throwing any old thing that you plucked off a rock, you know, you're matching up to that, uh, not quite as effective as trying to match up to the adult insects that you see. Um, really handy to use a seine to try and match up, uh, you know, to bugs more exactly. Um, and a seine is just basically a screen that you are going to stretch over your net or put down in the water on a couple of sticks in order to uh, catch some bugs to uh, match up to them more effectively. Um, there's a really cool one we've got in the shop called a, a handy seine, um, and that one basically attaches to the handle of your net and then just stretches over the head of your net so that you don't have to carry something big and extra. Um, really cool setup and handy. Um, if you want a little more basic option, you can actually use a paint strainer that fits over a five gallon bucket that you can get like at Home Depot or Lowe's, all right? And uh, this fella will actually just uh, kind of like that handy seine, stretch over the head of your net and then you can put that guy down in the water and uh, you know use that to catch some bugs. Um, I do find it important when you're using a seine to use it properly. So the, what I'm first gonna do with this seine, I'm not just gonna go straight to kicking up rocks, okay? First, I'm gonna put it in the surface of the water, maybe just eight inches down to see the bugs that are close to the surface or actually catch adult insects. Um, if I don't find much there or I don't find what I'm looking for, I'm then going to put that seine all the way down to the bottom of the river and but still not kick up any any rocks. OK, I'm not trying to get a cross section of everything that's in the river. I'm trying to figure out what the fish are eating right now. And if you can get ideally directly downstream of where you see some fish feeding and put that seine in the water without kicking anything up, then essentially you're going to catch in that seine the same bugs that that trout uh, is seeing. All right. Um, then if I just want to get a cross section, uh, you know, of what's in there or maybe just, you know, take a look at a bunch of the different colors of bugs or get more specific matches to what's around, then I'll go ahead and kick up some rocks upstream of my seine, washing all those bugs and weeds and stuff into that seine and then getting a closer look at them. Um, but I think it's really important to take those other steps first if you're actually trying to figure out what the fish are eating, not just taking a lesson in bugs. All right. Um, and it looks like we got another question. Why don't we take that David Cooper is asking, how do you fish a leech on a two or three fly rig? I decided some mini leeches up, but never caught anything on them. Somewhat unrelated question to the hatches. But, okay. Uh, good question nonetheless. Yeah, good question. I mean, I do use a lot of leeches on the South Platte, those little Mayer's mini leeches and some other kind of basic ones that I tie. Um, typically, I'm going to use that as my first fly on the rig. Um, depends a little bit on what's going on. Um, you know, if the water's high, I'm even have like a worm on the front and then a leech behind that and then maybe some other nymph behind that but typically my leech is going to go on first um i always with leeches always try swinging the fly a bit um that's another one of those flies that you're going to get some really aggressive strikes on um I, frankly like sometimes you're just like 
you're, you're not even really thinking about, uh, you know, fishing it. Like you're just finished a drift and it's swinging out and you're just letting it kind of like hang there downstream. Maybe you're distracted by a deer across the river or something and a fish comes and smacks it. So make sure that you are, uh, you know, swinging that thing out frequently, um, because you do get some really good action that way sometimes. Um, also that said, my favorite colors of leeches, uh, at least for like the Decker stretch would be like olives and browns, um, or rust color. Um, I occasionally use the black or white, but mostly I'm using those olives and browns. That's your most natural colors. All right. Um, cool. And thanks for the question there. Um, so, um, one important thing uh, that I find, and like you, a lot of you probably take this for granted, but keep switching your until you find the right fly okay uh even if you think that you have a good match to what's hatching uh, or the bugs that you see in the water um sometimes like you know even though there's blueing all blueing olives around they might or might not be eating that blueing olive you know maybe there's so many more midges around that they're eating that instead um you know maybe the size blueing olive that you're using is one size too big or it's a shade off on the color um, or maybe you need something with just a little tiny flash to it, like a jujubatus or something. So just keep switching around those patterns until you find something that works. Um, and, you know, it's it's not uncommon for me to tie on 12 to 15 different bugs over the course of a day of nymphing. Um, sometimes even more than that if it's a, it's a tough day um, before I really figure out something that's working good for me. All right. Uh, which is good incentive to sit at home and practice up on your knots and make sure you're competent on those. Um and of course, uh, let's see, I think it was John that asking about that was asking about the uh, double dry fly rigs earlier. Um, so many of the dry flies and so many of the hatches that we see on the South Platte, they're so small that if you just throw that thing out there by itself, you're not even going to see it land and you're just guessing it when you get a strike. So personally, whenever I'm fishing a small dry fly that I'm having a hard time seeing, I'm always, always, always going to fish it behind another more buoyant, more visible dry fly like that elk hair caddis or the big parachute atoms or a stimulator. Um, generally, I like to spread them out a long ways. Um, that's preference. I know some people uh, who like to get them really close together so that they will land in the same current. Personally, I'm more of the feeling that I want that thing to land with slack between the two flies. And that is going to make those flies drift much more independently of one another and reduce the amount of drag that you're going to get. Um, you have to take that with a grain of salt, though, because frankly, on a, like a real windy day, if you're trying to throw a nine foot leader with three feet of tippet attached to it to an elk caddis and another three and a half feet back to your blueing olive, that's going to be really challenging. And you're just going to probably end up in a tangled mess more than once. Um, so, um, you know, use your best judgment on that one. But me personally, my typical rig, I'm adding two feet of tippet to that nine foot leader or some five X tippet to that elk caddis and that small dry fly. That's when that fine tippet really comes into play. I'm almost always using six X on my smaller dries and I'm going to put about three to three and a half feet of that six X tippet from my elk caddis back to that little blueing all over that little midge that I'm fishing behind it. Um, Cool. And it looks like we got another question. Uh, this question is from David Scott. Uh, any current tips for someone heading into Cheeseman this weekend? He hasn't been in a couple months. Um, you know, besides what I mentioned, which is take some size 18 to 20 black midges. Um, man, um, you know, the fish could eat betas in there like 365 days a year or two. So, you know, uh, some good blowing olive nymphs. Um, maybe think of a little bigger blowing olive nymph too than you might typically. Um, we're just starting to get into that season where those hatches are going to start changing and you're going to see some bigger bugs. So even if there's only a few like size 18 blowing olives out there, um, you could see fish really keying into those. Um, it's kind of a tough changeover season though, because like right now, mostly we're using like little size 22 and 24 midges in there. Um, but uh, take some of those large black midges and take some, uh, you know, size like 18 to 20 blueing olive nymphs, like your Juju Betas, like your RS2s, uh, like your Darth Betas. Cool. Looks like we got one more question uh, here. Nick is asking, what's your preference for tying on the second fly through the hook eye or on the bend of the hook? Oh, gosh, Nick, I've gone back and forth on this one, buddy. Um, personally, right now, I'm all about tying to the bend of the hook. And um, there's various reasons for that. But 
without going into an extremely long-winded explanation, which I'm very famous for, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I like to go off the bend of the hook. It keeps the rig straighter, less tangles, less chances of it snagging a bush as you walk by, um, less chance of a fish grabbing the trailing fly and then wrapping your uh, lead fly around a rock or a stick and getting it stuck and then breaking off. So again, multiple reasons for it, but I tie off the bend, uh, you know, almost without fail. So cool. Uh, questions are rolling in now. We got well, one more. This is a question. It's more of a statement. Uh, there are several people giving you. Oh, okay. Quote. Thanks, Tucker. Uh, I will mention a little hey, shameless cool. plug for Tucker. So he's returning to uh, the, the guiding <laughs> season this year was it april 10th yeah starting about uh, yeah so, mid-april uh, i'll be back to guiding give, full-time give the shop a call 303-733-1434 you can request tucker uh he can uh while he says he's not an entomologist he knows all the fancy terms for it so you can talk to him about bugs <laughs> uh talk about the south Platte, and obviously go catch some fish so Oh, yeah. appreciate that, Yvonne. Um, yeah, I and mean, you guys want to get out on the water with me, uh, like Yvonne said, call the shop and uh, we'll we'll get you out there. So, um, uh, last call for uh, last call for questions. Josh Dillers in the chat, another Trout's Guide uh, as well. So, uh, hey. yeah, last call for questions. There's probably like a 10, 10, 15 second delay. So we'll awkwardly sit here and uh, wait for those last call questions. Cool. All time. right. You could uh, Perfect. twiddle your thumbs so I can, uh, or you can talk to us about your art. Right. I mean, if I had a beer, you know, I could like sit here and drink that or something. But uh, yeah, it actually is pretty cool art, isn't it? Uh, Eileen Clatt is the artist on that one, by the way. So a little uh, rainbow rainbow, they call that one. the best art of all the art. That's an off <laughs> reference for all you Sweet. sports fans out there. <laughs> I missed that one. So okay, we do have one last question uh, from David Cooper. Cool. He's asking weight on top yeah, David. or bottom of your net weight. Personally, um, my nymph rigs, and I mean, I vary it a little bit, but for the most part, I like ninety-eight percent of the time it goes indicator, then my weight, and then my first fly, and then my second fly, and third fly. Um, I almost always do triple fly rigs on the South Plat, unless like, I kind of found a fly that's just you know, beating them up so good that I can just take everything else off the line. But uh, personally, I feel that you're just going to get better drifts that way. The nymphs are going to act more natural with that weight. Uh, you know, instead of being like at the bottom of the rig and you're you're kind of keeping tension on it, um, it's just going to act more natural and kind of drift through the current a little bit nicer. Um, fact is, though, of course, like if you're into Euro nymphing, that's a different ball game and your anchor fly with the weight on it goes at the very end of the rig so that you can control that depth of the thing manually with your rod. Um, fact is, uh, yeah, mostly I stick to indicator, you know, American nymphing and, uh, yeah, weight always goes on first that those flies look uh, nice and free behind it. So appreciate the right, question. Last, David. last question for sure. One more, One more. uh, yeah. JS customs. He's a beginner fly fisher here. He, uh, fishes on the Madison, in Montana, not the worst. Uh, cool. How is a good way to figure out hatches, what sizes, uh, sizes, and what flies to fish? Um, I mean, so that could be kind of a loaded question. I could answer it different ways. Um, mostly, it comes down to your observation of knowing or of understanding. Like, okay, like I have to actually see the bug that's out there and try and match up to that bug. Um, but you got to do some research beforehand to be prepared with the right bugs. So you want to get in touch with a local fly shop close to that river that you trust um, and get some good fly recommendations. Um, most good shops are going to do some sort of stream reports. So like even better if you can walk in and like talk to somebody. Uh, but uh, short of that, get some good uh, you know fly recommendations off the stream report so that you're prepared before you go and have kind of a range of those bugs. Um, even if somebody told you, hey, this gray RS2 size 18 was working great yesterday, don't just buy gray RS2 size 18, okay? Um, have a variety of stuff because what the fish eat day to day and even throughout the day can vary. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to your observation. 
And, you know, it's a matter of if I'm using a midge pattern early in the morning and it's catching fish and then about 1030 or so, like I kind of stop catching fish on that midge pattern, um, I assume they've switched to something else. It's not that fish have gotten less active. They have changed what they're eating to something else. They, they pretty much have to eat almost constantly uh, to, you know, maintain good cal caloric intake and, and survive. Um, so, um, yeah, it, you know, if I have a fly that's working and then it stops working, I'm absolutely going to start looking around and figure out, uh, you know, okay, why are these fish no longer eating this midge? Uh, am I seeing caddis? Am I seeing blueing olives? Am I seeing, you know, a stonefly hatch or something else uh, that, uh, you know, might key me into what those fish are going to eat? Um, when there's not much of a hatch going on, they're typically going to go back to eating some of the other food organisms like worms, like leeches, um, you know, maybe some stonefly nymphs, even though they're not hatching, uh, scuds, if there's scuds, uh, you know, around in your river or sow bugs. Um, but yeah, ultimately it really just comes to constant observation. And, um, you know, part of why I typically use a triple nymph rig, uh, particularly on the South Platte with these picky fish we got down here, um, is that I want to throw the whole buffet at them. And, you know, if I've got it dialed in when I'm guiding on the South Platte, if I was there the day before and I had a triple fly rig that was working, chances are one of those flies is going to work pretty good earlier in the day. One of those flies is going to work pretty good through the middle of the day. And then another one of those flies is going to work pretty good in the afternoon. Um, so, um, you know, that's a little tough to dial in if you're not on the water every single day. Uh, but again, just use your observation. Constantly be looking around for bugs. Um, look in the eddies. Look in the foam lines. Use your seine. Um, shake bushes next to the river to see what is recently hatched and see what flies out of those bushes when you shake them. Um, use all that stuff to try and figure it out. Um, I wish there was a simple answer to that question, but kind of one of the cool things about fly fishing is that little bit of complexity. And when you put all those pieces together, um, it's a really satisfying feeling. So, um, and when in doubt, experiment. Just try on some, you know, tie on something else. So, all right. Uh, that's going to wrap it up. I would also add, Tucker. Uh, you can also find a friend that you can annoy the, every day you go fishing with them. And right. if they remain your friend, they're obviously good people. But, uh, yeah, you can annoy them constantly <laughs> about the choices they're making. And that, uh, that, that worked for me. Right. There you go. Perfect. You know, I mean, of course, it helps if you have like a buddy who's catching fish. Then you can just go and like bug them and figure out what's working. But, um, but uh you know, if you really just can't figure out what's working, well, hopefully you got like a Montucky cold snack in your pack or something like that. And you can just like chill on a rock by the river and, you know, enjoy the day, uh, even if you're not snacking them. So, all right. Cool. Well, thank you again so much for coming, folks. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. Um, uh, as Yvonne mentioned, I'll be getting back to guiding here, uh, you know, uh, sometime in April. Uh, until then, I'm in the shop Tuesdays through Saturdays. So if you want to come down and talk or give me a buzz sometime at the shop, uh, give us a call and uh, we'll uh, help you out as much as we can. So thanks again, folks.